So without further ado, let's get started with our first talk um, from Dr. Alfred Langley. So Alfred is the founder and president of the International Society for Logotherapy and Existential Analysis in Vienna. Early in his career, he studied medicine and psychology at the universities of, universities of Innsbruck, Rome, Toulouse, and Vienna. Then, after years of hospital work in general medicine and psychiatry, and in an outpatient department of social psychiatry, Dr. Langlis started a private practice in psychotherapy, general medicine, and clinical psychology in Vienna in 1982. At the same time, he came into close collaboration with Viktor Frankl, assisting Frankl's lectures and working with him in many fields of logotherapy. Dr. Langlis lecture, lectures internationally and has been a professor at the universities of Vienna, Klagenfurt, and Moscow. He has over 400 scientific publications to his name, as well as two honorary doctorships, six honorary professorships, and a gold medal from the Republic of Austria for his scientific contributions. You can learn more about his work at www.langla.info. So, uh, Alfred, whenever you're ready, let's just get started. I'm really excited about this, and uh, yeah, just best of luck. Yeah, thank you, Neil, for the invitation. I'm very glad to, to meet you and your students of the Weekend University online. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to share with you this existential access, these existential thoughts in the field of psychology, and which uh, offers a great help to come to a richer, more fulfilling life a life in which I can hopefully become more and more myself and be more and more really present in my world, in my family, in my relationships, in my working place. So, since I'm speaking from Vienna, let, that, let me show you first, this is our famous Cathedral, St. Stephen's Cathedral in the center Gothic dome, which right now has an installation, a light installation on the top. Uh, you see a light ladder leading directly to heaven. So Vienna is the place where you have a ladder going directly to Vienna, uh, to, to the heaven, from Vienna to the heaven direct way. And this is uh, the, uh, the Gloriette, so-called Gloriette, on the hill on the top of the summer castle of the emperors, Schönbrunn. Uh, this is what I see from my window when I look out of my window right now. I, I'm there. And this is now coming from Vienna to the topics we are going to talk about the table of content, what I had prepared for you today to speak a first a little bit about logotherapy and Viktor Frankl and maybe a bit of my relationship with him, then the further development, existential analysis, then the existential concept of what is it to be a human being and what dynamics is it is included in being a human being. And what does it mean to live existentially, to make an existential term very helpful for daily practice? And then the central concept of existential analysis to live with inner consent. And then I to show you a little bit the fundamentals of existence and the fundamental motivations. And at the end, I would like to help you to find better meaning uh, by describing my meaning capturing method. Okay, I hope you are ready. Logotherapy. Logos in Greek means word, but also meaning. And its founder, Viktor Frankl, chose this term to describe his meaning centered access to the human being. Frankl was an MD and a psychologist, had two doctorates, and, uh, lived 
through the whole, almost the whole 20th century. He has undergone two world wars and had to live in a concentration camp. He died in 1997. His central term was will to meaning. The human being is motivated because he cannot do anything deliberately, freely, without seeing a meaning, more or less conscious. We don't have to think about it in most cases. We just take it for granted that making a soup for preparing a dinner or so is meaningful. And so we almost automatically do it. But when we have a closer look and investigate the people and, and, and uh, then we see, they see a meaning in it. And when the peace in the family is broken, I don't see a meaning to make a soup. And then it's not, it doesn't have meaning and I'm refusing to do it. So whenever we want to do something deliberately, we have to see a meaning in front of us, a meaning towards which we are acting. This is his central message. He worked with uh, Sigmund Freud. He wanted to undergo a psychoanalysis. Then he encountered the practical way how psychoanalysis worked. And he found that this is not the way how he wants to deal with people to sit behind their head and saying just mm -hmm, most of the time and not being in a direct dialogue with people. So in the 30s already, he started to uh, develop logotherapy because at that time, you know, in the 20s of the last century, there was uh, a, a, a famine in Vienna. People were, half of the population didn't have uh, to work and were jobless and there were really hunger and people suffered from meaninglessness. And so he, at that time, he already saw the importance of meaning as a central concept for the human being. And so he centered his work around meaning and read uh, Max Scheler, the philosophy, a German philosopher, an existential philosopher, who worked a lot about values and finding values and working with values. On, the, on this uh, philosophy, he developed the uh, logotherapy already in the 30s, before World War, I, World War II, and introduced the meaning concept into psychotherapy. Irving Yalom uh, describes in his book, Existential Psychotherapy, that it was Frankl who first introduced the importance and the relevance of meaning as a concept in psychology and psychotherapy. Then came World War II, and as a Jewish person, he and his family had to go to the concentration camps, and he survived four concentration camps. He was incarcerated four and a half years. He lost his wife, he lost his parents, just his brother and his sister, and his brother, just his sister survived. She could flee before they were deported to the concentration camps. What is central in his work, Franke is really great in the development of a philosophical concept of man, of the human being, for psychology and psychotherapy. And this is the great value of logotherapy. It gives orientation how to look at the human being, how to look at life, and to make our life more human. A bit in contrast or in distinction to psychoanalysis at that time. So, logotherapy is uh, a philosophic, based on a philosophical concept of who am I, and I will show you a bit of this, and what does it mean to live a human life, and how and what is meaning. And what relevance does meaning have in our life? And he said, it's not enough to have just a philosophical concept. We also need to practice it. And therefore he called logos, meaning therapy, as a therapy, a support 
a practical support for people who suffer from a lack of meaning. Therefore, logotherapy can be called treatment through helping to find meaning for people who lost it. So that be it so by a loss of an important partner or uh, life when, or, or a child, for instance, then our life may really appear meaningless, empty, because one of the greatest value went lost. Or it can get lost slowly, uh, by everyday little decisions, and we are not aware of how empty and meaningless our life becomes, and suddenly we start to suffer from it. And so he, frankly, really brought, gave a great contribution to that, and his logotherapy also helped me when I had a many years lasting a crisis of lack of meaning between 16 and 21, I really suffered from a great absurdity of this existence. And while I, when I read Frankl, it helped me just by reading and applying what he wrote to fill it up and to overcome it. And this is the main reason why I am in yoga therapy, because I could see how it helped to me. And so with this development, he built up a counterweight to psychoanalysis. Uh, in psychoanalysis, meaning, person, the spiritual dimension, you will see that, what it means, doesn't play a direct role. The psychoanalysis and Frankl was, of course, he, he, he was in Vienna and Frank was in Vienna and he even gave teachings about psychoanalysis, but at the end he found in psychoanalysis, there is missing a whole dimension of the human being, which he became aware of its importance when he read Max Scheler. He had it intuitively, he had felt it intuitively, but cognitively, he found a teacher in Max Scheler's philosophy, Scheler, S-C-H-E-L-E-R. And so he built up a supplement, as he called it, a supplement to depth psychology at this time. And his hope was that all depth psychology is going to make use of local therapy as a, a, a contribution, a, com a complement to their depth work. This was his idea, it didn't work out like this. But what his aim was, was working against reductionism, not to reduce the human being just to drives, to sexual needs, to, or to overcome um, inferiority complexes, as this was the idea in Adler. Frankl did his study with Alfred Adler, not with Sigmund Freud, and he uh, did the exams in the Adlerian school. And then he started, even in, while being in the Adlerian school, to stress the human factor. And he started to speak about that the human being primarily wants to find meaning. The human factor. And he, the great work in the field of psychology was that Frankl contributed as a founder of humanistic psychology, one of the founders of humanistic psychology, to uh, reduce the, psycho the danger of psychologism. Psychologism is the idea that uh, we can uh, de describe human actions out of psychological needs only. And psychologism doesn't consider that a part of my hunger or my sexual drive or my sleeping need, etc., which are of course drives and influence our action, a part of that, there is also, there are also real values in the world which we can see, detect. I see the beauty of a, a, a child, of a partner, the, of, of a flower, of the, of the the sunset, and it attracts me, and not just because I have a need to see sunsets, because, but I'm, 
I'm just attracted and struck by what by these colors which are there. So there is something something valuable outside of me in the world which speaks to me, and I'm receptive for them. And this was the main counterweight which he brought up to depth psychology, because depth psychology tries to explain all human activities and experiences out of needs and drives. And this is reducing our existence. We have them, of course, so depth psychology is correct, but not in pretending that this is the only motivation. Because there are also other motivations values and and things which have importance and, and and appeal to us outside of us even when we are not hungry for them existential analysis is a development which started uh, on the basis of logotherapy but is a development which we made in let's say, a side of logotherapy, because it follows another paradigm. Franck's paradigm was ultimately a metaphysical paradigm. Somehow there is always God and the belief in God, or the, the God as a fundament in his theory of logotherapy. In existential analysis, the paradigm is different. The main idea is we can trust our own perceptions. We don't need God. God may be there and we may believe in God and it's not excluding God, but it's not used as a basis for the theory. But the basis of theory is our own, let's say, mental, spiritual capacity, which we have. And so existential analysis was developed in the 1980s onwards and it was uh, given it, it was described or it can be defined as to help people to live with inner consent to what we do we will come back to that i just give it as a first definition and i discussed it with frankl i, li I worked with frankl for 10 years and then uh, we developed uh, methods like the personal existential analysis method in which we use psychodynamics and we work with bio biography. Frankl was against that and we use uh, individual self-experience in our training. Frankl was against that because and so it came up, there came up a tension between Frankl and our society, the GLE, the International Society of Existential Analysis and Logotherapy. And so somehow Frankl supported it, but then he found it goes too far away from his original logotherapy. Because logotherapy searching for meaning is only looking towards the future, towards meaning and value, and not looking back to the biography and the life history, he said this is this is anti-logotherapeutic when we do that, and is not working with an individual with self-experience in the training because this is like looking at one's own umbrella and then we overlook the world and its values and meanings. This is not self-transcendental, as he called his work self transcendent, stepping over one's own borders and boundaries. And um, the and psychodynamic is, doesn't have a place in logotherapy. And so he, we discussed it and then he separated and he withdraw his honorary presidency of our society, which he had, uh, this position he had, since it's starting and then there were now born by his withdrawal a new was born a new psychotherapeutic 
uh, approach existential analysis, centering on looking at the human being and not what is behind all meanings, ultimately uh, an intuitive search for God, but looking at the own capacities to find inner consent and as such to come to a fulfillment and to a spiritual experience in our life and then hand it over to religion, to all religions, to maybe a Buddhism or a, a Taoism or a Christianism or whatever. But this is not no longer than our concern. Existential analysis where they had developments which went beyond global therapy, the phenomenological access, we have a specific theory of emotion and of psychodynamics, which is not in logos therapy. Franti was against the development of these issues. The theory of psychopathology and etiology based on this phenomenological access. We work with biography and trauma, we have methods and uh, specific treatment for diagnosis, which is a bit in difference to uh, Amy Van Dersen's or Spinelli's existential analysis, they refuse making diagnosis and to have specific treatments on them. They work more philosophically, we work possibly more with psychological issues. In the center is freedom. This is, by the way, equal to Spinelli or Van Dersen or Tantam's existential analysis. Freedom in the sense of, I decide what I'm doing, and as such, I form my life. And this is accompanied by needs and orientation, and requires me to stand behind that, what I decide for. When I decide to come to this seminar, this is me who went this way and switched on the computer. So it is my responsibility. Responsibility in our understanding simply means I'm capable to stand behind and to let me see in what I do. See by others, see by myself and have an inner harmonious feeling that this is really worthy, good, that I do, then I am responsible. Freedom and responsibility belong together. Or as Frankl put it, Frankl had uh, sometimes had often very good uh, pictures. He said, America has a statue of liberty on the East Coast, but they need a statue of responsibility on the West Coast to have both poles which belong inseparably together. EA can be defined as a, an access or an approach to help people to arrive at authentic decisions. Not just arbitrary decisions, but decisions which correspond to what I really do feel inwardly. And to come to a responsible way of dealing with myself, with the world around. And this may result to inner fulfillment. That I feel what I do gives me so much that I get satiated, full of the value of the good, what I can experience by what I do. Let us have a look on the concept of the human being. Human being, we can make a circle and inscribe to this circle three dimensions. Body, of course, human being has always a body, 
the psyche and the person. This needs a bit more explanation. The human being thus can be seen as a unity, therefore the circle. These dimensions always are there together. They cannot be separated. They are, the human being is not composed by these three dimensions. The human being is this unity in which we can describe different forms of appearances or aspects or, or tensions or dynamics. The unity, despite the diversity, we have a diversity in us. This makes the human being very interesting. The belonging together of different tendencies and to bring them together constantly. This is a task which we have. What is psychic? Psychic we call the drives, hunger, uh, thirst, movement, drive for movement, for physical movement, needs to sleep, personality traits, the more anxious personality trait or depressive personality trait or histrionic personality trait, the moods when I get up angry in the morning or when, I, when I'm hilarious, this is a psychic reflection of my being in the world and the coping reactions to the, the defense mechanisms as they are called in psychoanalysis coping reactions, uh, the fleeing when I'm in danger or the becoming aggressive when I'm attacked or the freezing reflex and to stand still and not to move anymore, etc. These are psychic capacities which makes us so human. But we share them more or less with the animals. They also have psychic elements they help us to survive. And on the other side, we have a, a dimension which is really human, especially human, the personal, or we can also call it spiritual in the sense, not of belief or religion, but in the sense of mental capacity, the freedom and the responsibility. In other words, making choices and standing behind what I do. This is not a drive, this is not, I'm not pushed to decide. I am attracted by a value. Being able to support a situation and to accept what is given, this is an act. To see values, these are then the, the, um, um, the main dimensions of human existence and the fundamental motivations in which they are uh, described more in detail. Just to give you an idea here, I can be in this world when I can accept what is given. And it is so, it makes my life warm when I see that a, a dish has, is good and tasty and I like to, to eat it and I like to turn towards and to be oneself authentically and, and being able to encounter and to find meaning. All these we call the personal dimension or the spiritual dimension or the very human dimension of the human being and they may not be reduced to just drives and needs in, uh, in the uh, psychic dimension. It is, a, there is a difference. Now let us see what is the existential dynamics. Being human, this makes it a bit philosophical, but don't be afraid when I cite Heidegger, being in the world, Dasein, it doesn't say, it simply says, I am a, as a human being, it makes me human that I'm in a constant contact 
with things which are different to you, which are otherness. The computer in front of me is not me, and I'm in contact with it. And I'm constantly standing on a ground on which I'm walking. So being human means being in an inseparable uh, connection with otherness in a world. And I have an understanding of this world and I can deal with it. This means Dasein, the German word Dasein simply says being here, being there. There in a world, in my family, reading a book, and I'm in the book, being in the world. There I deal with the other, but also with myself. I constantly decide if I'm going on to read in this book or if it's time to, to go for a walk or to have a food, some food. And this means existence, this coming together of being myself in constant contact with otherness. I exist in contact with others. And this contact, we call it, there is, it is of course an exchange. As we breathe the air, as we drink the water and eat the food and talk with our friend and with our child and talk with ourselves and all this is happens in a dialogical exchange. Dialogical means I am personally present. I'm not just an automat, a machine. No, I'm personally present because I make a decision. I say, yes, I'm going on to read or to listen to this uh, conference. This is a basic picture in existential analysis, which shows us how we understand our being ourselves. I, as a person in the middle, you see, I'm constantly connected and related to an outer world and to an inner world. And as such, I'm in a dialogue with myself and with the other person and with my dog and with my plan and with the world in general and I say, oh, how beautiful, oh, how terrible. This makes, this forms me in my essence. So, this simple starting point of the human being, I, as a human being, am in a world. And this requires openness, to see the world, to receive the beauty of the sunset, as we said. And to be free, as a human being, free means I'm able to make at least some decisions. I'm not totally free. I'm uh, in a reduced way, but there is left open a freeway, a leeway, a, a, a certain amount of freedom where I can make decisions. I can stop my screen, my computer here, or I can stand up and, and for a coffee or etc. This is the, the free way, the free space I have to make decisions. This being free means that I position myself. So these are the two legs on which is built. <laughs>
existential analysis. It needs, the openness needs a phenomenological attitude to the Tausa. And this positioning needs a personal activity. And this openness, this phenomenological attitude, I will describe it a bit later. This openness means that I do not do anything. The only thing I do is to look, to listen, to open up inwardly and to let come in what is there and to let me be in touch. It is so important that we don't only experience our life cognitively but we, we, or, or reflect about it, but that we also have find our feelings towards it. And the personal activity, we will see them and go into them in the next chapter. The openness is to let be the situation myself and leads to the existential term and the activity leads to the inner consent. These are the next chapters then. The existential term is based on openness. This is the next chapter. So far, we have seen the, we described first logotherapy and then existential analysis. We see that logotherapy is centered about finding meaning and is based on a metaphysical concept. Existential analysis looks at how can you apply your freedom and be open. And it is based on letting myself be in touch by what is there. Now, let us have a look on the existential term. How does openness look like in practice? Phenomenological attitude means let oneself be asked by the actual situation instead of claiming for it. This was Viktor Frankl who brought that into logotherapy and as such into psychology and psychotherapy. Openness means set aside what you want. Set aside your question, what do I get for that? Take the situation as a question towards you and look at what you can do, contribute to the situation. We make it a bit more clearer afterwards. See yourself as the decisive, decisive center of the world. This means, in other words, you see on the right side the world, on the left side me, the free person, the world, the others, the you, the vis-a-vis -vis others, and this fix axis between world and me, this belonging together, we are just two poles of the same, this means Dasein, being in the world, as we say. This is the starting point. And this world is, and you see now the blue arrow on, on top, this is asking me, this speaks to me, this demands me. There are requirements of the situation, And my task is to elaborate my answer, what I can give back as a response, how I can act. And you see, this is the existential situation in which we are constantly. Whatever is there is a question towards me. And my life consists in giving answer. Being human means being questioned. 
And to live means giving answers. In other words, when you hear this, to make it practical, when you hear this, you can ask yourself, while this does not correspond to what I think, and then you may reject it. But if you apply this openness, then you set aside your previous position or your prejudice or your your knowledge and all this. This means phenomenological openness to see the phenomenon. What phenomenon is what appears to me. But that things may appear to me, this needs that say that I'm open to them, that I let them reach me. And then you listen and you try to understand what is it telling me, what is there, what is the value of it, what reaches me. Is there something that touches me, that says, oh, yeah, this is, this makes me understand what I may do, what I do possibly every day or most of the time. Or this gives, sheds light on why I have problems or why I don't feel so much satis satisfaction and fulfillment, fulfillment in my life. What is this telling me? and wanting from me. Can I apply it? This is a question. Can you make use of that? This is the question which you receive with this. And then you make your decision and say, yeah, my answer is, or in making notes for now and then coming back to it or to listen the video again or to talk with my friends about it or to to speak with my partner and telling him or her that I was too much blocked in myself. I, I, I realized that I didn't, wasn't open enough to him or her. And then I give my answers. This would be the perfect way to apply it. When I see uh, potatoes in the kitchen, they are asking me, are you going to make a soup out of me? Or what are you going to do with it? Whatever is there, it is the question, what are you going to do with it? And of course, it is a burning question. When we suffer from a cancer, the cancer is a question, existentially seen. The, quest, the cancer is the question, how are you going to make life, a good life? having a cancer. This is now the question. And my life is going to be the answer to this. And it is possible to have a good life, even with cancer. If we take the cancer, not as a verdict or as a, a, a rejection of life, but an invitation of life to look differently through another side, through another aspect to our life. We have reached the time of 45 minutes and I would like to offer you a five minutes break here and we will be back in exactly five minutes. And go on then with the next chapter, the positioning myself. So five minutes break, thank you. Being in the world, this being human in a world needs two poles be set before. Positioning myself is the second pole. The old first is to be open to this world in which I live. This means to be human, to be in a world of understanding what is there, of receiving, of being touched, and giving my answer, which brings me into life, means to find my inner position and the inner position 
uh, leads to the inner consent to do what I have consent for. In the consent to what I do. This makes me being actually there, really, as an active person taking part, bringing myself into this world. What is inner consent? It is simply an inner felt yes or disagreement, and I have consent not doing it. It is a consent where the sentiments come together. It must be felt. It's not enough to just think it is logical or it is rational. And this inner consent is the actualization of the personal freedom. Here I am free when I feel a yes to what I do. When I feel a yes, I feel a yes, I want to take part in this seminar, in this lecture. Then I feel I'm not forced. Then I feel it's me, it's the activation of myself. And it makes myself present and participating. I want to do that. I feel, I agree. It's congruent with myself. I, I feel an inner yes, oh yeah, this is interesting. Uh, it attracts me. I feel a yes to that. When I do things with an inner yes, I'm realizing me, my freedom, myself, and it makes me taking part and participating. Then I can commit myself. I can to Latin mitere means sending. I send myself with it. Con is with. I send something with my action, me. Then I'm committed. And when I'm committed, I get inner fulfillment. I get what I, I get to experience. Wow, this is valuable. This is good. And then this gives me inner fulfillment. Whereas when I do think without things without inner consent, without an inner yes, because I feel forced or nobody else washes the dishes and, and I have to do that. And, uh, and I can't say yes to that. I don't have consent. Then I'm not committed. And at the end, I feel inner emptiness. I feel abused, used. I was lending myself to something. The inner consent is me. But consent, when you have a closer look to it, is not always easy to gain because it is based on a highly complex basis, which we call the cornerstones of existence. The cornerstones of existence are the questions, the central themes of our life. It means that we have to deal with them in our life. And so we come to the next chapter, to the existential fundamentals. What are the cornerstones of our existence? Four dimensions of existence are there. We have to deal with the world, with the facts, the givens, and the life. I'm living and being me and not you with all my limitations and capacity. And to we live in a wider context. These are the four windrows dimensions of existence. We look, we'll have a look at them for most of the rest of our time. The world means Perceiving the facts and possibilities, and possibilities. The fact is, today is Sunday, last of October. These are facts, but it has possibilities. On this Sunday, I can use the time to be on this con conference, or to, to go out, or to meet friends. 
within the fact we have all these leeways, life means we feel and we deal with values. Being myself means I sense myself. I'm all, it's always me. I have a constant feeling of I am listening, doing, feeling, thinking, washing my hands, cleaning my body, caressing, having sex. It's me. And all this happens in a wider context of a family, of a, a life I live for, of meaning, of becoming, developing. Every day we are developing something and we become a bit more or less ourselves. These cornerstones are door openers for existence. Being in the world opens the door to look at what can I do? Can I really be in these in the midst of the givens around me? I can be, can I be? To live opens the door to what I like to live. To be myself opens the door to the question, may I be so as I am? And the context brings up the question, I do, do I do what I should, what I'm called to? And if all this happens, then we have, uh, we find our will. We can put it in a schema, in a, on a table with four legs, then the table plate existence or what I will, my will is how I realize my existence. Is based on the world connected with I can, life connected with I like. The person, this being myself and encountering you as a person on the basis I may, and the greater context, the meaning with I should. These cornerstones are constantly present and need contribution and participation. And so they are motivating us constantly to be present in the world and to connect with values and to be oneself and to uh, look at what we are going to develop. And therefore, we call, I say, lead to the four fundamental existential motivations. Now we are going to look at them closely. These FM, fundamental motivations, we call them the structural model of EA. You know, in psychoanalysis, the structural model is Ego, super ego, and it. These three levels. In existential analysis, the structural model is world, life, myself, and the bigger context. This is a, a broader structure describing the human being. The first condition for a fulfilling life, for a fulfilling existence is 
I am. This baby is. This baby puts their hand on the hands of an adult. Thus, the baby can be. I'm always exposed to this world and I'm constantly in the question, can I be? I am. Can I be here where I am under these conditions in this partnership relationship? Can I really be there or do I feel a threat, a pressure? which doesn't let me thrive and brings me to the edge of surviving psychologically. Can I be on this working place? Can I be with these parents? Can I be with this disease, with this body? Inwardly and outwardly. Uh, we are all this put thrown into facts, givens, realities, which bring up the question, the most basic question of existence, can I be there? If I cannot be here or there, then I experience angst, anxiety, fear, insecurity. This shows me that I am not well based in the first dimension of existence in this connection with the world. But I can contribute to improve my connection to the world by looking at if I can accept what is there. Accept means saying, yes, I can let it be. I don't have to fight against it. I can accept my partner. I don't have to fight my partner. I can accept my disease. I'm not eaten up by rebellion. I let it be and have my time and freedom to go on with my life under the new condition. Endure is acceptance when something is hard to take, when it takes effort, when it is um, demanding very much. To endure a headache, to endure the, the menstrual pain, to endure the partner and the difficulties we have right now, we work on them, but we have to endure it. I don't necessarily have to flee and to run away. I can keep my place. This is the great action in enduring. Of course, it must be meaningful. There are other dimensions of existence, of course. But it's important to know that to endure something can be, it is when it is meaningful, when there is still, still perspective and hope that something good can show up, then to endure is a great act. It's not a resi resignation. It is an act, a contribution, which, bring, which leads to the fact that I remain there and I remain present. And it has preconditions. Now, this is maybe a bit too detailed. It, I, maybe you don't have to remember that so, uh, so detailed, but just to give you an idea that there is a whole elaborated, uh, great uh, theory behind these words, these almost simple everyday words which we make use of 
and we you make we use these everyday words because they are closer to us human beings. But to be able to accept, to let be, and acceptance means letting be what is, it's, it's so, okay. I can let it be when it doesn't bring me into danger because I feel protection, I have enough space, and I feel support. There is a basis underneath me that it keeps me up, it supports me. Then I can accept. If I do not have enough protection, space or support, I cannot accept it. And then it makes my being in the world more difficult. So you see, this first dimension shows me how can I be better in this world? By asking myself, can I be, do I have enough strength and, and skills enabling me to be where I am, to remain? To breathe, breathing is another sign of this dimension. Where I, when I cannot breathe deeply and freely, then I have difficulties in being in this world. This is how it reflects on my body. And I can be when I, have, when I feel protected and have space to breathe and feel being based, then I can accept and let things be because they let me be. Now we have a similar structure in the other dimensions of existence. I am alive. I'm not a stone. I'm a living being. A biologically living being, a psychologically living being, a mentally and spiritually living. I'm alive. And this brings up the existential question to myself. And how is it about, how is it for you that you are alive? How is it for me that I have a life, that I am bestowed with a life? Do I like that? Do I like to live? Did I ever ask myself, how is it for me? If I do not like to live, then life becomes cold. And it's not anxiety here in this dimension, we fall into depression. Depression is the feeling, well, life is not good. I got enough. I may even have suicidal thoughts to stop my life, to step out. It's not warm, it's not good. It's not fulfilling, rewarding. It's just pain and suffering, frustration. Of course I can be, I have enough to eat, I have enough money, I have enough protection and space and support, but the quality of my being is so bad. This is depression. But we can contribute to prevent depression by turning towards what we do, turning towards my partner with whom I speak. Not just read, continue, going on reading my newspaper and giving my answers behind my newspaper, but letting the newspaper fall down and sink down and look at my partner, turning towards my partner, really physically turning towards, but also inwardly with my attention, my awareness, being with the other, coming close. And if I lose a value, if I have, if something is broken, if I, I have a, to support an accident. If I lose my health, 
and becoming sick, if I lose my relationship, some, if I lose whatever is of value for me, you should also turn to this loss and not just let it be a side saying, it doesn't help to turn towards it because it already happened. I cannot change anything. It just produces pain. No. Turning towards means I bring life into this wide spot of my map, of this abyss, of this loss, of this pain, bringing life into it. And then I start to grieve, to be sorry, to feel and suffer. And this moves me inwardly, bringing up tears. They are such a relief. They are a sign of life itself, which tells me you lost, but I, your life, I'm still there with you. You're not alone. It's like the, the knobs on a tree in the spring, which start to flourish the small leaves which sprout again. I'm there. And then I'm crying. And crying is the deepest in the movement of life. And tears are movement, are water, water of life. And we go through the griefing stages coming back to life and coming back to this, my decision, my freedom, which says, I'm ready to go on with this life, even after this loss. There's still enough basis to have a good life. It will be a changed life, but it can still be a good life. Then the grieving process is over. When we didn't grieve, then, this may lead to depression. When we turn away from life, when we turn away from our pain, then depression arises. Depression tells me the way you live is not good. This is the psychological source of depression. There are, of course, other forms of depression which are neurologically based. They need medications primarily. So not all depression is of this way this manner, but the psychological contribution comes from not living with enough turning towards values and also towards losses. Life. Do I like to live? Do I turn towards what I'm doing. And this has also a layer underneath preconditions, the relationships. I take up relationship with that when I turn towards. I take time when I turn towards. And I come close. And vice versa, on these three preconditions, these are the bases which allow me to turn towards. Life, you see, has a lot to do with relationship, time and closing. And of course, with when we feel life, we are open for values. Values resonate with our life. Then there is the third dimension. After world and life, I have to deal with myself, to be myself, to find myself, to become more myself. And I'm a bit hmm, trembling. May I be so as I am? Can I trust myself and be sure of myself and show myself and refer to myself? And do I find myself at home? If I do not find myself, and if I lose my own, this leads to hysteria. 
Hysteria is a suffering like anxiety in the first dimension, depression in the second. This is in the third dimension, in this relationship towards myself. In hysteria, I have no good access, no constant access to myself. I don't feel myself. I'm like separated from myself. Inside, it's dead. And therefore, life turns towards the outside. And I live in the outside. And I make my theater, my drama, etc. in the outside because I can't bear it alone with myself. I have no access, the door is closed. Terrible suffering. It looks so theatralic and, and dramatic in the outside and we have a tendency to smile about hysteronic people, but ultimately they suffer like a depressive person but on another dimension, on another content of their life. You can contribute and prevent hysteria by having a close look at myself, on, at, by beholding myself, looking what I do and checking if this resonates with me, if this is really me, who wants that, who feels that, who can stand behind that. And to draw boundaries, to say what is mine, what is my own, my real own, and what is yours. And what is yours is not mine. It is your opinion which you bring up. This is fine for me. It doesn't have to be my opinion. I draw a boundary. It's interesting for me to know how you think, what you feel, what you need. But it doesn't mean that I have to think and feel and to act as you want, as you want from me, etc. Draw boundaries. Also three preconditions. We have to pay attention to ourselves and to justice to ourselves and to look if we can appreciate ourselves. To pay attention means to be aware of myself, to see what comes up in myself, to uh, be present with myself and to do justice to myself. This means take seriously what shows up in myself. Needs, thoughts, wishes, tendencies, pain, etc. Not to step over them, not to neglect, but to turn towards it, second FM, and try to do justice, to, to take the time for it, to, to see what is needed, to, to work for it, and to act and handle things in a way that I can feel an inner yes to myself and say, well, I did it really the best way I could. I can appreciate myself for that. Ask yourself, for instance, what can I appreciate myself for? The way I deal with my children, with my friends, with my colleagues in the work, the way how I do my job. Do I feel appreciation for that? How I do it? And to apply all these pre three preconditions to others, to pay attention to others, to do justice to the other, and to give them my appreciation, to tell them, wow, you did that so well. I'm really impressed. This is appreciation. It's not similar, not the same as, as praises. Appreciation is how I feel, I personally feel about that. Justice, appreciation, uh, attention helps to do the own activity. Then I can look at myself better and draw boundaries better. And when I look at myself and behold myself, 
and draw boundaries, then I um, contribute to the development of these preconditions. Finally, as a result, we have a picture of ourselves, a self-image. The ego, the me, becomes stronger in my decision, and my decisions become authentic. It's really me who lives. Finally, the fourth dimension. I'm there, but for what? Is that good? To what end? What should become? in my life. A family is an answer, having a family, but it doesn't need to have children. But of course, this is a very natural way to see and find a meaning in life. But it can also be a good job, a help for other people. What for am I born? What for am I there? Do I have this feeling in my job, in my private life, that I see myself in something greater, something which transcends the actual situation? When you take part in this uh, lecture, this action is transcending this situation. You take part in this lecture to make use of it in your work, in your life, with your friends and, and people around you, but also for yourself. So it goes far beyond this hour. It is a contribution to your life, to your future. Then it is meaningful. What for is it good to take part in this lecture? For myself, for my work, for enriching my life. If I do not see and find and feel that it is good for anything what I do, then this brings up the danger of addiction to alleviate the pain, to not having to feel it so much. And suicidality. In suicidality, we don't see a meaning in this life anymore. We see a meaning in death, in finishing our life. So it is a very existential dimension. When I do not feel and see myself embedded in something bigger and greater, like a family, friends, children, a belief, a religion, etc., then I'm in danger to become suicidal. Then I don't see that something good can become out of my being there. And then I don't see such a perspective in my life. Why should I live and go on? Of course, as long as this is, it is pleasant, pleasurable, okay, I can bear it, but even that can become boring. We can contribute to this dimension, especially when we look at, do I see myself in concordance with the situation? Do I resonate? with this relationship, for instance, because I see a value in it, and so I see a potential that there can still become something good in this situation. And to dedicate, to commit, on the basis of the preconditions, we need a field of activity, a structural context, Field of activity means something valuable which we can experience or which we can produce, bring forward. We need 
a great context which structures our life, like the the family. The family is something good. I want to contribute to this great context. Or the working place, we do good jobs there. It is valuable for the society. It's not so much dangerous for the climate. And the, the, the leaders are not corrupted. Then it is valuable to work, to be in this context. And to see a value in the future, something good coming on. The result is we find existential meaning, which is, you can define it as like this, existential meaning is to devote to the most valuable possibility right now, here and now, in this situation. It is existentially meaningful if you feel and see that listening to this lecture is valuable and for this hour it's the most valuable i can do if i see something more valuable to do to be done in this hour let's say a friend which i never met since years just shows up improvisionally and and rings my bell and comes into my apartment then it is more valuable to speak with the friend than to listen to this also valuable uh, lecture, the most valuable in the situation. And so you see existential meaning is highly adaptable to the, all the situation. It is flexible. I must feel to become existentially meaningful that it is good. And it leads to something good. Therefore, meaning is like a signpost which points at the side of the road to the value. Life is a road. Every day working and, and experiencing is a road which leads to something valuable. Every action I do, every experience I have, if I can see a value in the future, if I can feel already the value before me, the value for which I dedicate myself, for which I align, then I feel it to be uh, meaningful. This little picture describes a lot of what is meaning. And the field of activities, Frankl described them, the prerequisites for finding meaning. And he said, you can, you can find meaning always by doing something valuable, creative values, by experiencing something valuable, experiential values, like a good talk, a caressing, a listening to music, a enjoying a meal, experiential values, and attitudinal values. When I can't do and experience something valuable, then the value is in my attitude for what I do this, for what I suffer this through, to find out that I do it for my children, for myself, for my God. The three, frankly called them the three main roads to meaning. Let's sum it up. I can, I like, I may, I should. Basis gives ground, solid ground to I want. Then my will is fairly based. And as such, it is a strong will. And I will not give up so easily. Because I come to commitment, I may even experience a flow in what I do. And it gives me back inner fulfillment to my engagement. 
Now let us come to the last chapter. I won't briefly give you into your hands a method to find meaning, to capture meaning, to find out what can be meaningful, just in case you don't find it just on the basis of what we described so far, to look at my inner consent. Do I feel consent to what I do or to what else would I feel inner consent? Do I sense this inner yes? If this is not enough, then we can go and break down the situation into the steps of finding meaning. It has a similarity to the four dimensions of existence, but now applied just to the finding, the meaning finding process, perception of what is there. Evaluation of the situation. How is that for me? Making a choice. Who is going to do that? And finally realizing where am I going to do that? Let us have a closer look. Perception means reference to the reality. And this is important. If, some, if we want to really find meaning, we do not refer to wishes or dreams or ideas. We look at what is given, what is really there. It makes meaning attainable. It must be, uh, a, we must be able to do it practically in the given situation. For instance, after this uh, lecture, what could be meaningful? What is my reality? I'm not under the palms in, uh, in the Bahamas. I'm at home. I may have my family beside me, or I, I, I have uh, my mother or father, uh, which who want me to see them, etc. In within this realm of reality, what is there, and what is today in at twelve o'clock or at four o'clock possible to do? Then we evaluate the possibilities. We, have a, we make a reference to our feeling, to what is pleasant, the vital feelings, and what we see to be valuable. And we look at possibilities which join both pleasure and value. Then this gives vital power to the meaning then we see that this situation is taking me, is attracting me, is appealing to me. For instance, I have many possibilities for after the lecture of today. I had the possibility to meet a friend or to go to a pub or to go for a walk or to read a book, etc. And by evaluating, I make a hierarchy of values. What is the most valuable for me today? Not in principle, not ideally, but for me today. I may be a bit tired or I may be full of what I heard. So maybe the best possibility could be to just sit down and reflect and ponder a bit of what I heard. The second best would be to go for a walk, the third best to meet a friend. And so we have a profile like the peaks of the Alps. And you see the higher peaks and the lower peaks. And of course, the most meaningful is the highest peak. 
But other peaks, who, which are not as high, are also meaningful. Not that much, but they still contain some meaning. And so we come to the third step, to make a choice, to refer to the own. What am I really ready to do? What am I ready to invest here and now? Do I have the power? The most valuable would be, let's say, to ponder about what I heard and to take time for myself. But I may feel um, I'm not really motivated to that. Of course, it, it is the most valuable but maybe I take a peak which is not that high for today. Maybe I do that tomorrow. But today, maybe I just take a nap, something I didn't think before. Because for now, it corresponds most to myself. You see, meaning is as practical and to realize it. It becomes meaningful only when we do it. Meaning is the connection uh, of the staple of me and the world. Instead of having passive wishes and uh, of waiting, it activates me and brings me to personal commitment. And then I take the nap. And after that, I will have a feeling, most probably, that this was really good. I followed my personal own, and the need was stronger than the value I saw. And I did the best for this hour. And this is me, to do the best thing possible for this hour. For me, in the state I feel I am right now. Let me come to the end. Existential happiness is when we find inner consent in what we do, inner agreement. And in, when we feel the inner yes, or when we work on the situation that it, we can come to this inner yes by changing the outer world or by changing the inner world or by doing searching for something different. Happiness is this inner fulfillment. This is the deep happiness. And let me cite Frankl, him citing Nietzsche, rewording Nietzsche, but putting it into a more psychological and not so philosophical frame, which shows the power of meaning. Frankl liked to cite Nietzsche with this thought because it shows how powerful meaning can be. He who has a why to live for, can bear almost anyhow. Even concentration camps, even sicknesses, even really demanding situation, as long as I see what for I do it, I can bear it. Thank you for your attention and thank you for your attention. If you want to get more information, you find here some home pages for the US and for Great Britain. And in this GLE UK org website. 
or gluk.com maybe it is com website you can also find and subscribe for a supervision evening for free which will be held on november 27 Oh, sorry, on November 29, from 7 to 9 to 8.30, London time, in the evening, there is a free supervision. I'm making a supervision with a colleague to show how we work practically and how we apply existential analysis. This would be a supplement to this lecture. Thank you very much. Now we have the time for your questions. Hello, Alfred, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, very good. Thank you. And can you see me okay as well, or is the camera? I, I don't see you, I see your picture. I see I should add again the link. GLE-UK.com, November 29, you can subscribe there for free. I'll just add that to the chat bar there for anyone that wants to. Um, Public supervision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, thank you for a, a fascinating presentation. Um, I think people got loads um, loads from that, so just well done. That's the first thing I want to say. Um, thank you. Now, we've got we've quite a few questions from participants, so I'm just going to go through some of these now. Um, before we get into them, I'm just curious to ask, you know, what was, um, what was it like, what was Viktor Frankl like to work with as a, as a human being? You know, what was your relationship with him like? Could you maybe expand on that, on that a bit more? Mm -hmm. Of course, I like to do that. Um, Viktor Frankl uh, was a brilliant spirit, a brilliant man. And he uh, liked to, to make jokes for each situation, to describe the content of a situation, to grasp out the most important, the essential of the situation. He liked to make a, a more or less appropriate joke. And so this is, we, we know that Jewish people have a great inclination to joke. The Jewish jokes are world famous. And so he was a typically representative of these Jewish people. And so he did it. And, and we had a great fix together because I had a very bad memories for, memory for jokes. So he could tell me the same joke five times. And I could always laugh heartedly and openly because it was <laughs> as it was for the first time I hear this joke and so and he had a great pleasure with me laughing again and he remembered that I already told you that joke and I said oh yeah you told me but I already forgot so this was the more private side and, and he was a, a very hard worker accurate worker very very precise in thinking, in wording, in, in defining, in using terms. And I loved it. I learned really a lot of, of him from this preciseness. And he was philosophically straight and knew a lot. And he introduced me in this collaboration over years. So this was uh, very central for me. And it was a great teaching. And I'm very uh, grateful to him for what I could learn from him and, and, and also had so much fun and pleasure with him all the time. So th this was our collaboration and I talked him, to him about my clients and he supervised me and he uh, gave his ideas and this was a way how I came to develop methods, uh, these 14 methods. Many of them uh, arose by the dialogues and talks with, with Frankly. And this, this was a great time together. And I'm a real, I was really hurt and, and sad about this rupture. It was a rupture. 
And I, a rupture which I didn't expect. I, we were so well connected. And later on, I heard from his daughter that uh, years later, that it was under the pressure of other logotherapists who wanted to split and he gave in. And it was not his personal conviction. And I know from his wife, who, she told me some years ago on a phone call that he suffered very much from this split, very much. She told me, she, as, as his partner, um, she saw how much he suffered from this bit. And I also think it was not correct. But we are also all human beings and also frankly. And so we had to suffer it through and we did it uh, as a, comp as, let's say, a, uh, a last gift I wanted to give him was uh, a book I wrote about him in the first year after his death. A year after his death, it appeared in German, uh, Victor Frankl, An Encounter. It, was, it is not a direct biography. It is a way to, to bring him into an encounter to the reader. It, this book is translated into Spanish in Herder, Barcelona, and into Russian, but not in English, which is a bit a pity that we don't have it in English. Wow, well, it sounds like he had a he had a major impact on you, and I, I'm really sorry to hear that you know there was a rupture there. But I suppose it's just one of the he was under pressure from different people in the logotherapy field for that to happen, and it's a shame it did. But what can mm -hmm. you do? Um, I'm curious to ask now, uh, Alfred. What situations would you say existential analysis is best suited for? Like, are, are there any particular situations where this, this approach is most effective, you would say? Um, to be approved officially by the state authorities, health authorities of the different countries, and we got such approvals, you have to show, and we had to show, that existential analysis works with the whole variety of psychic and psychosomatic and psychosocial disorders and pains and sufferings. And we could show that. And so we got this recognition. But nevertheless, I would say that there are areas in which uh, not many people of EA work in, although they do have effective working. But let's say, for instance, people who uh, come with sadomasochistic uh, difficulties. There are few of us who do such work. Um, and the work with schizophrenia, for instance, our psychiatrists, of course, do it. But the psychologists, few of the psychologists work with, with schizophrenia, for instance, or with uh, uh, paranoia or so. There is quite an experience and there are some publications, but not that much as in other fields. And so it has mostly to do with the fields in which people work. We have lots of experience nowadays with children work, with the family work, with couple relationships, etc. Um, and of course, from history, uh, all work related to meaning problems are very central to existential problems. And we have very much experience in working with anxiety, depression, hysteria, personality disorders, addiction. And so the most common uh, difficulties people suffer from. 100%. Okay, well, um, our first question here is from Matthew. And Matthew asks, Establishing what the client's personal values and beliefs are will help define the relationship, needs and goals with self and the world. How does the existential analysis process best go about establishing those values and beliefs? Yeah, we do it phenomenologically. This means we do not propose values, but we help the people find their values through their own psyche, feelings, uh, through their own uh, uh, sensing of what touches them. And so we let the person look around 
in their world where they stand and ask them what is it what uh, what you are dealing with what you are forced to feel maybe or what uh, attracts you what uh, love you is there anything you are interested in a depressive person would say no nothing maybe this person needs first a medication to uh, heighten the level of energy and of power so that they are capable to see over their uh, the border of their dishes uh, and to to see into the world but some people are apathic because youngsters for instance they are rejected and suffer so much from bad parental relationships etc and then we have to work first on their pain because their pain is blocking them and their pain are uh, the existential need for now to turn towards their pain to suffer them through to become healed and then they can go and see other values which attract them Okay, thank you very much. Um, Ruth Freeman. Um, Ruth asks, why do people lose their sense of agency, would you say? When people are occupied with other issues, which they do not plan to be occupied, but they are, the psyche tells them, you are too lonely, you are too hurt, you are too traumatized. Then psyche blocks them in their agency and the psyche tells them or wants to bring them close take time for this what you need primarily it's not the time yet to to be active in the world first heal yourself uh, do justice to yourself look at yourself uh, look at what happened to you and regain yourself your own and then after that i give you free i support you in dealing with the world and become active again 100 percent um we've got one here from rachel if someone is so separated from themselves and they don't know what they like or who who they are even how would you begin to approach this work with the client uh-huh in such a work situation we share a lot of ourselves as therapists to give them an idea how it looks like to be oneself that they have a possibility to encounter me first and through this encounter they can encounter themselves find themselves start to talk with themselves for instance i would say well i see you are really not much motivated you are so apathic i you know what i feel i feel so sorry for you it's so sad to see you that way because i believe i strongly believe this is not you this is this is you in your being um, captured blocked and not really free and i feel so sad and sorry and i would really like to know what blocks you what hurts you so much what you would need what you are interested in and to support you in that and to find it out but would you be willing to share with me a bit what you are frustrated from what you are suffering from to tell me to to let me take part i would appreciate that if you would be so open and i would like to be with you and to get you to know you a bit better and to see where your strengths are and what you would like then to do. May I be with you for this? And so 
to open up, to open up the space in between, to to help them and trust in, in the therapist and to let them feel and war being warmed up by the encounter of the therapist. Mm. And then it starts moving the patient, the client. That's really interesting. So the therapist is almost like a model that the client can exactly. use to start, start getting Exactly. There. And this is very specific for EA or in general, in humanistic psychotherapy, you have it. But EA goes the farthest in this point by sharing one's own uh, participation, one's giving one's own presence, letting have them a look into me as a person, how it touches and moves me. Others also do it, but we do it the farthest. Brilliant. Okay. Um, we've got one here from uh, Jan. Um, how does your work compare with uh, Joel Voss's work? Um, and what do you think of his elaboration of meaning? So, whom? I don't know this name. Uh, Dr. Joel Voss. Um, ah, Voss. Yeah, yeah, I told it was Joel was uh, I have great appreciation for his work. He tries to combine all meaning accesses into one. So this goes a bit too far, I think. He tries to elaborate it on an empirical level, which is very valuable. But somehow the the real power gets lost, and I think. To, to reduce the, the horizon of meaning in, to a real existential approach gives more power and strength into the meaning finding process. So he does a great job and it's scientifically very important. And he has brilliant uh, publications and he is the leader, I would say, in the meaning research nowadays. Uh, but for practical issues, I, in my experience, at least in my hands, this access which we have is more powerful uh, than what he proposes, at least for my hands. We have to say people and therapists are also different. For others, it may be different. Okay, cool. Um, just a final question. I, I heard you mention during the talk this concept. I think it was Heidegger's concept of thrownness. And yeah. could you maybe elaborate on on that a little bit more? I think this is such an interesting and important idea for just just life in general. So maybe could you expand on that a bit more? Yeah, in brief, it is a great, a big, great concept. In brief, it says. Um, it belongs to life that we are thrown into situations where which we are always thrown into situations which we did not choose. There are at least elements in each situation which are just given and which we with which we have to deal with. And sometimes there are elements which are painful, uh, threatening difficult and then we get more the feeling of i'm really thrown into that situation and i have to deal with these conditions and this is the life task this is this means does i to find myself within this situation to really be myself so uh, as a conclusion of this thrownness the answer of existential analysis is Wherever you find yourself being embedded, having to tackle with, to deal with, the main task is not to resolve the situation, but to try to be authentically yourself by what you do. Don't alienate yourself. Then if you alienate yourself just for resolving a problem, it was not worth doing it. Look at your personal inner consent. Be yourself. Personalize yourself. Personate the situation. Be, be person. Let's show up what is your essence, what is truly you in your life. 
in your situation, in this situation. Stand up for yourself in this situation and give what you can. Give it then. Then you are free. Then you can commit. And then it is rewarding and fulfilling, fulfilling in most situations. Fantastic. Well, you mentioned in the talk about how this was such a flexible approach and it can be applied to so many different situations. And I can I can see why why that's the case. It's very, very powerful. And, you know, there's a temptation whenever things get really difficult or you're in a bad situation to sort of want to escape. But this seems to be about accepting the, the real struggles mm -hmm. and difficulties of life mm -hmm. and, and working with them and finding meaning in that, you know, so that's, it's so powerful. So Alfred, that's all we've really got time for. I just want to say thank you so much for your presentation today. Um, we're getting the comments coming in here. People have had such a, a great experience. So thank you. And yeah, before you go, is there anywhere you'd like to send people? I know you're doing the supervision and people can find out about that, out about that at gle-uk.com. Is there anywhere else you'd like people to go online? No, it's, for me, it is not. This is fine. Uh, you, you saw my, uh, the, we have an English website also uh, in uh, existential hyphen analysis dot org and uh, there you can also find, and you can find a lot of english literature on my personal website lyingle.info great okay there is an english section and there you find many publications and literature and also youtube videos in english spanish okay in german and with russian translation some of them okay that's all right. well thank you alfred and thank you for all the work that you're doing and putting out into the world it's it's making a huge difference so we appreciate it and wish you the best of luck going forward um thank you everybody else we're back at one o'clock for our next talk um from jules evans so i'll see you guys then and enjoy your lunch thank you bye bye